KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine, and this is Get the Funk Out. Standing by to join me is director Stacy Lee. And we're going to talk about her powerful film, Underplayed. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I saw the trailer. I got some information, uh, I think, from the PR rep in Manhattan. I was blown away, loved the trailer, and I thought, I got to see this film. I got to talk to you. What inspired you to make this? I'm, it's a very essential film. Yeah, that's a big question. I mean, I, um, I'd done a film on a similar subject back in 2016, um, and it was much more, um, it was just focused on a collective in New York City who predominantly um, represented and got paid for a lot of underrepresented artists, women, LGBTQ+, Black, queer, um, all of these artists, and they, they created this kind of community, this support system, so that they could bring more women up through the infrastructure. And um, I thought it was very timely um, back in 2016 also. Um, so post, you know, Time's Up, Me Too movements, all of these things that went, went down, um, you know, after making that film, I genuinely thought that um, a lot of progress had been made, things had been changing. And so when I got approached to make this film, I was a little bit like, oh, I'm sure, you know, things are better. And I started to look into the statistics and was shocked to see not only mm. had they not gotten better, they'd gotten worse. That's um, awful. So there's this almost this sense, I, and I genuinely felt this too, that progress had been made, um, but perhaps maybe it was only lip service and people becoming aware of it and maybe even issue fatigue kind of going down. Okay. So I wanted to make a film that um, evolved the conversation in some sort of way that rather than just being asked about a woman in the industry, how about we see these women? And how about we try and, um, I guess, create a, a, a film that allowed them and their craft and their talent to lead and their gender to be second. Mm -hmm. um, and just through that kind of reshuffling of, of uh, you know, agendas, it somehow managed to push the conversation in a different direction so that we actually talk about them as artists first um, and it's see how love. we tell yeah. them they are. And through that, we subtly are able to kind of start to kind of tackle some of these larger agenda issues that take place. You really take us into their lives and their backstories and how they got to where they were. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, for instance, um, Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. The story of her harassment on Twitter, and here she is. You don't know what somebody is battling, depression, anxiety. No one would think, you know, they probably think she was living at the top of her game, and she wasn't. Yeah, I mean, that was a really big part of our approach with this film is to try and humanize first and foremost these subjects, whether you're into electronic music or not. And I just happen to be a periphery fan. I'm not in the scene. I wasn't in the scene. Um, and I wanted to come at it from that objective point of view because I think the electronic, what's happening in the electronic music industry is a mirror of what's happening in a lot of other industries as well, film industry included. Yes. So it was very important for me for these characters to be seen as humans first, for us as an audience to connect with them um, on that level. Mm -hmm. So that um, we kind of break down the, the, the star, you know, phase and actually are able to realize, wow, she's actually incredibly successful. She's got to where she is, right. but she's also facing these same issues, even though it, she is as successful. You know, people are constantly second guessing her. And for me, an important element to kind of portray within that film is, she, yes, she's suffering from all of these things, but also at the same time, she's tracking a lot she's a female entrepreneur she's doing every single element of her job she's got her eye on it there's Everything. no ghosting here she's not standing right. up on her decks and going woo that's yeah. she's not pressing one button no she's doing all of it um and what that brings with it is, a, is this additional kind of psychic weight for women where they not only are doing everything themselves but potentially this is their one moment to shine so we have to make the most of it we mm -hmm. have to tour around the world um, and that concept of kind of relevancy that is this additional pressure that, um, you know, artists today who are underrepresented face, you mm -hmm. know, is this there's one time to shine? Is, is it going to be over tomorrow? And that's what creates this additional level of um, anxiety uh, that 
I don't think, um, you know, the predominant voices in the industry would face. Yeah. You, you give a lot of history too. I don't want to give too much away, but you give a lot of history of different instruments and it, it's both educational and insightful and it's, it's really so well produced. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the, History is is everything with this industry, um, and really, uh, um, it was so. The moment I started to kind of delve into the 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 kind of beginnings and the origin story of electronic music, it made the the necessity for diversity even more important. The 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 backbone of all of the you know advancements to to this billion dollar industry and today was founded by some incredibly talented women tinkering away in their little laboratories, making these, you know, blips and blops and clicky sounds. Yeah. But but really um, that those were the backbone that so much of this industry was, you know, based upon. Then as, you know, the it, it started to find traction and new genres were born within the space, those origin stories are even more profound. You know, uh, house music, techno music was was founded amongst the most diverse communities possible, black, brown, queer, LGBTQ plus communities that um, created these safe spaces for people to feel welcome, you know, to be free, to, 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 to really celebrate this kind of notion of people all dancing together to the rhythm of the same drum beat, you know. Yes, and full and, acceptance. Full acceptance. And full acceptance. Yeah. And, and this is for me where the, the, the great tension of the story lies is that the very origins, the very principles of this industry were founded on diversity, on inclusivity, on love and all of these sorts of things. And the tools are, are very democratic too. It's not like you had to go out and buy a very expensive guitar or you know, the, the, now you can you know, buy a, a cracked version of whatever software and teach yourself. So how you know, a, a, an industry that is democratized in terms of your access and your ability to kind of get in there and this incredible origin story, how do we get to where we are today, where it is incredibly, um, you know, three to four percent of uh, technical and production roles are, are, are women, even less for women of color. How do we get here? Mm, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's Crazy. For me, that, that was a huge part of the story. And I think even so many artists today had no idea. They obviously knew the origins and are aware of the origins of, you know, the genres uh, diversity. But just to even go back and see, and and I think the film opens itself with Susan Chiani, who's an incredible pioneer in this field, and she doesn't even know that her fellow sisters who were back in the sixties and seventies doing what she was doing, and she thought she was an island unto herself. Right. Only now, in the two thousands, learning that there were other women out there trying to do the same. It's, exactly. It's, it's a story that was very important to me, and I think also just propels the argument forward you know, how much music are we not listening to? How many voices right. are we not hearing when we're, you know, being, you know, isolated into just this one formula of sound that is success? I love that how you listed the top 100 DJs and it was such a small percentage that were women. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Shocking. I mean, that was one of the earliest statistics we kind of came across because the electronic music world has two parts to it. There's the mainstream, very commercialized world, but there's also the underground as well. Um, and to see that, yeah, 5% were women. Mm -hmm. And that was actually across both Billboard magazine and DJ magazine, which DJ magazine is, uh, you know, probably predominantly more um, respected in Europe and, and Billboard being uh, in the United States. But both of them had the consistency of just five percent you know of women being the individual artists and that just says so much because you know when people get on those lists you know festival bookers look to that um labels look to that right. um journalists look to that in order to vouch who's important and who's worth kind of listening to so if if those kind of markers and this isn't laying the blame solely at the feet of, of Billboard, I think the issue is systematic. And the issue is, you know, how do we, how do we create a pipeline where more voices can be heard? Yes. How do we, um, and, and unfortunately what happens when these lists get released, it just kind of compounds the issue because 
um, these are the voices, these are the only voices, and when we're going to program a festival, oh, we need a woman, oh, here's one here, tick that box. Right. And rather than diversity um, in a spontaneous, organic manner, it mm -hmm. becomes paint by numbers approach, which is really unfortunate because mm -hmm. um, it doesn't allow for spontaneity and discovery to happen. And I think what festival programming, one solution that kind of came up over and over again was just that notion of that pipeline. Yes, yeah, sure, you have to make money and um, get the artist on the main stage um, who we know is going to sell tickets, but people don't just come to festivals to know the tried and true and to get their one Instagram shot. They come to festivals to, to wander into a tent and suddenly discover the next thing. Something new. And, and that's where the magic of um, it happens. That's where the magic of discovery happens. And that's an incredible opportunity right there for festivals and programmers of all sorts of club nights and things like that to start to think about bringing some of these more diverse voices in so that they do have that opportunity to shine, to learn, to develop an audience, to be able to access this community, which will then lift them up and yes. give them the chance for a main stage in future years. Yes. I always say that, and I, I love music. I grew up listening to so much music. I grew up in Manhattan, loved listening to DJs, but you know uh, someone is talented when you don't even know their music, you don't know them. And you just, as you say, you walk in and you are captivated. Mm -hmm. I went and looked up, is it um, Sherelle? Mm -hmm. yes. I, lo I looked up <laughs> Boiler Room Sherelle mm -hmm. and I watched mm -hmm. that video of her and I thought, wow, I would love to be there. And you're probably thinking, this woman is older, you know, like why would she want... <laughs> But I think that would be so amazing, like transformative to be in that boiler room watching her. Oh, 100%. And I think Sherelle would love that too. That, that's what Sherelle is about. Mm -hmm. She's about bringing this energy, creating this space um, for everybody to be included. That's mm -hmm. the whole point of it. And, and you know, she's done a really um, incredible thing of bringing, it's a very niche form of electronic music, but through her performances, footwork and juke and all these kind of sounds that she brings to the fore are really taking off because she has created this portal into this new world of sound and that's that's the beauty of electronic music that's what I'm sure the founders would have wanted it to be like is to really be able to bring that energy and for to supersede um you know the politics of of the dance floor yes when you were doing your research for this film, were there some things that you were just blown away, like seeing these women playing, like, is it the theremine? Theremine? Uh, theremine, yes. Theremine? Yes. <laughs> that, I mean, how exactly does that work? Is that, um, I'll let you describe it, but I'm just like, how does that work with the sound waves? I mean, how does that? Oh, I mean, to be honest, I'm not technically proficient in any of these sorts of things, but I think it was considered an early electronic instrument just by sheer nature of the fact that it wasn't um, organically played. Sure. Uh, it's something that was played using sound waves, which I think that same technology is what went on to um, evolve into what we know now know as electronic music. But I, I can't be quite honest because I'm not- I'm gonna have to look it field. up. Yeah. I trying to figure it out last night. I'm watching the video of that older woman. I forget what- Clara her... Rockmore. So yeah. there's a beautiful video online and featured in the film. Uh, by Clara Rockmore and she's playing this beautiful uh, classical piece Swans and it's just it's tear-jerking it's it's so beautiful and powerful and um and it's just one of those moments that I think you know you just see a whole world of an industry just beginning right there and then yeah. um but what did surprise me yes was seeing that and obviously you see a lot of the the older woman you know, and they're tinkering in their science labs with their twin sets and their pearls on, I making know. this boots <laughs> and blobs. I just, it's, it was always such an interesting uh, image to me when I saw that because it, A, it defied the notion that women can't be technical. You know, we've, uh, we're always socialized coming up through school that we have these certain roles that we have to play. Right. And when you see that, you just know that this isn't something that's, uh, you know, it's not something that's innate in us. It's something that's taught in us that we can't do that kind of thing. Right. Um, and Daphne Oram and Delia Derbyshire and all the pioneers have just blown that notion kind of out of the water. Um, to go back to your other question, though, about what surprised me, what was came through over and over again, and I think is just such a beautiful thing, is this notion of female entrepreneurship. Every single one of the artists we featured 
faced some sort of obstacle to making it. They, whether it was finding a community, whether it was finding representation, whether it was even getting a club night in Tiger Paws instance, when they came up against these obstacles time and time again, when that wasn't possible for them, they created their own. They worked outside of the system in order for the opportunities to continue flowing for not only them, but the communities around them. And that for me was so incredible to see and so inspiring too. And I think very important for people coming up that are trying to break in to know the honest truth about how hard it is to break into the industry because the system of it is, is very complex and sure. um, you know follows a lot of formulas in order to ensure success. Um, but these women have all operated on their own kind of paths, right down to Rez, who, you know, she, they, there's this notion they have to control everything because I guess in a way, if they don't, perhaps a man has helped them out or, you know, has, take advantage they've got the innovation. Exactly. Yeah. And I think um, it's kind of sad that it has to happen that way, but it's also incredibly inspiring because that actually creates sustainable communities moving forward. What Tiger Paw has done, she's opened up a whole portal to this new world of people that can access this community, the sound, this space that is safe for them to be who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, that wasn't around prior to that. And that's, I think, something that as these threads kind of go out into the world will start to like hold space yeah. so that more voices can kind of come up and feel comfortable because I've seen someone before them who looks like them who acts like them you know have find success I think there was a, a quote in the film if you can't see it you can't be it um, and that's incredibly true definitely definitely and where is the film being shown right now so due to the, you know, <laughs> the, the constraints of our, our current time that we're in, um, we had a film festival uh, release in Toronto Film Festival and um, other festivals like Glasgow, Dublin Film Festivals. And it's actually going to have its uh, online streaming debut on Amazon this week on international. Okay. March 8th. March the 8th. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and other streaming platforms as well. You can find all the information on the website underplayedthefilm.com. It has all the different platforms that you can look it up and also other information about who's in the film, the statistics around the industry. So you can kind of get that greater context. It was very important to me when I made this film that this wasn't just a passive piece, that this was just the beginnings for all of us to engage yes. in the issue and to be able to talk about the conversation so we can move it forward in some way. Um, I, I was always um, blown away at when I read the UN report on the gender gap. It's going to take 100 years to close the gender gap. So this work that is not only necessary to, um, you know, for more voices to be out there seems kind of urgent because 100 yes. years is not in our lifetime. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a film that's definitely going to be seen by, you know, all different ages, but also a younger generation that could see themselves in those roles that these women are, you know, making happen. Those 100%. And also more importantly, thinking about, you know, music is a spectrum of, of all different sorts of sounds that can come and go. And right now we're listening to, when we only have a certain kind of person from a certain kind of background who looks a certain way, who finds success, we're only gonna have the potential to be exposed to this much. Like imagine how much we're not hearing. Yes. As a creative person, that's the exciting part of this whole thing is really being able to blow the spectrum open. Electronic music, the whole genre of it is combining sounds. Like, so the, let's get back to that. Let's find inspiration in those very roots of the industry of inclusivity, of mix and match and finding different things. And the music industry, the electronic music industry can only benefit from that. It's really incredible. I've, I've found myself just uh, scrolling through Instagram, looking at different artists using Ableton Live and their digital <laughs> audio workstations and, it's, it's so incredible what can be done. And especially right now in a pandemic, I mean, if people are stuck at home and they want something inspiring, I thought the mm -hmm. film is really ideal. And I'm sure you never imagined it would come <laughs> out at a time like this. Yeah, no, I mean, we shot it in this final festival season before the pandemic. So who would have known that we we're actually capturing this time capsule of an era Mm -hmm. that you know was very very unique and you know what's going to be interesting to see is what happens to live music when it does come back have they had the time to think restructure reorganize reimagine a world that is more inclusive and diverse or 
is it going to be more of a necessity to go back to the tried and true and safe and we've done this before so this works so it's going to be interesting to see which direction it goes obviously i want the former to happen um but who knows <laughs> i hope so i hope so where can people find out more about you and the film well the film is on underplayedthefilm.com um myself um i have a vimeo page vimeo.com slash uh, Stacey Lee, S-T-A-C-E-Y-L-E-E. -E. Um, and my Instagram, um, all of that stuff is all online uh, as part of the promotion of this film. Um, one thing to mention is that we also, you know, throughout the creation of this film, you know, the film industry also suffers from an um, underrepresentation point of uh, view with uh, women, you know, not being in key roles. So wherever possible within this film, from our director of photography, uh, Zoe Simone Yi, to our editor, Georgia Dobson, our, our composer, Kate Simcoe. We tried to in, uh, you know, bring as many diverse voices and, and perspectives into the film wherever we could. Not because we want to be token, but because right. it's necessary and they're out there and you just have to look for them. Yes. And everybody needs a first chance to do something. I myself included, this is my first feature documentary. It's such a, I is feel really? such a... Yeah, it's such an honor, you know, to have this chance to make a film, yeah. to be believed in and trusted. And it's my right and responsibility to pass that on. And it's not to say that um, there's incredible, my, my producer, William, William Krauss, it's, it's going to take both sides of the gender um, spectrum in order to uh, solve this issue. And it was oh. just as important that we bring our male allies along with us. And William is an incredible partner for me and incredible support in this. And yes, yeah, basically surrounded by, you know, pulling this whole pool of incredible women together to make this film. And I think actions like that shouldn't go unnoticed as well. Right. Well, it's a whole change of perspective. It's a mind, mindset shift that has to happen. 100%. Yeah. Well, congratulations. The film is outstanding. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, um, I uh, look forward to that we're going out into the world and hopefully starting some of these conversations in earnest. That would be great. Well, thank you again, Stacey. Thanks for having me.